this video I want to examine proofs using the first rules of inference in 7.1. Modus ponens, modus tollens, disjunctive syllogism, hypothetical syllogism. Let's start with an example. In this proof we have two premises and we're looking to derive the conclusion it is not the case that A. So we begin by seeing if the two premises match the two premises of any of the argument forms we have. It appears that they do. In fact, they match the form of modus ponens. And so 1 and 2 can be used to derive the conclusion A implies C, which we put on line 3. Notice that when we derive a line on a proof, we always have to justify it, saying where the line came from and which rule we used to derive the line. Having derived line 3, we can now use it together with any of the original premises to derive a further line. In this case, 2 and 3 seem to match the form of modus tollens. And so we can use those to derive the conclusion on line 4, which is, it is not the case that A, thus proving the argument valid. Let's consider a slightly more difficult proof. This one will require quite a few more steps than the previous one. We begin the same way, however. Let's try to find any two lines that look like the two premises of any of the rules of inference. A couple of possibilities suggest themselves. 2 and 3 is a hypothetical syllogism, and 3 and 4 is a modus ponens. But notice that in 2 and 3, by doing the hypothetical syllogism, we're going to make a proposition that's vastly more complex than any of the original premises. This usually isn't the case when you're trying to solve a proof. Usually you're trying to take complex propositions and simplify them in some way. So that argues against using 2 and 3. So we can use 3 and 4 to derive the negation of R by using the rule of modus ponens. Now it's possible that line 5, the negation of R, can be used with something else in this case, now we can use it with line 2 to simplify line 2, to make it a less complex proposition. So we can use modus ponens to bring down the brackets. Notice when you do this, you can drop the brackets and simply get line 6, R or A implies R. Since we have the negation of R on line 5, we can probably derive something from 5 and 6 using the rule of disjunctive syllogism. So from those two, we can derive line 7, A implies R. At this point in the proof, it might be hard to see that we're gaining on the conclusion, which is D. In general, in complex proofs like this, what you want to do is do things that are possible, even if you're not quite sure whether they're being helpful or not, because in most of the cases, they are. The exception to this will come in 7.3 and 7.4 when we get more rules, but we'll address that later. For now, let's consider what our next step might be. Since we have the negation of R on line 5, it looks like we can use that with line 7 and the rule of modus tollens to derive line 8, which will be the negation of A. This is going to help greatly because it will allow us to do something with line 1. Remember, you must use all of the original premises given in the argument. And since this argument had four original premises, the only way to solve the proof is to use all four premises at least once. So now that we have the negation of A on line 8, we can use modus ponens on line 1 to derive the brackets. Once again, notice when we bring down the brackets, we can drop them and simply get the proposition A or T implies R. Since we've just derived the negation of A on line 8, we can use that together with line 9 and the rule of disjunctive syllogism to derive our next step. Remembering that we have the negation of R on line 5, we can now use that with line 10 to derive the step 11, the negation of T. And finally, this will allow us to derive the conclusion D from line 4 and 11 using the disjunctive syllogism. Please be sure to practice the proofs in 7.1 section 3 and check your answers on the website and let me know if you have any questions.